tomorrow, uh, Memorial Day, where we as a nation will celebrate uh, this memorial, this honor to and remembrance of those who gave their lives for our freedom. Uh, I don't know if it's just me, but lately I've been uh, sensing such a, a deep and even intense appreciation for those who serve our country, and especially for those whose lives were uh, lost in uh, serving our country. I like how one said it they so eloquently, the patriot's blood is the seed of freedom's tree. Uh, it might have something to do with my culture, being an Arab and being born in the Middle East, but I think that sometimes, I don't say this to scorn or to, you know, be derogatory or talk stink, uh, but I just wonder if sometimes, uh, myself included, if we just really take for granted uh, the freedom that we have in this great country. My parents came here in 1962 uh, fleeing the oppression of Islam uh, in the Middle East. And I was about nine months old when we moved to this country. They had $20 in their pocket. And they uh, worked so hard uh, for the freedom that they so desired. And I just think that we have this debt of gratitude, this unspeakable debt of gratitude for all those who have served and even given their lives uh, for our country and for the freedom that we enjoy. Uh, really, this uh, church service here this morning is a testament to that. I mean, I, if you really think about it, we wouldn't be here. We wouldn't have this service here. We wouldn't really have this church here necessarily were it not for those who have served our country. I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Those of you that got the recent issue of the Calvary Chapel magazine may have uh, read the article with uh, the featured uh, story on the front page with Raul Reese. He has a tremendous ministry as a Vietnam vet to uh, the military, to the uh, veterans. And um, I want to encourage you to uh, you can write this down or just even do a Google search. You'll come up with it. If you, even if you just enter in Raul Reese's name, uh, he's the pastor of Calvary Chapel, uh, Golden Springs in Diamond Bar, California. It's takingthehillthefilm.com. And he does just a masterful job of talking about, uh, you know, the taking of the hill and then the one who took the hill on that hill we call Calvary who ultimately gave the ultimate and eternal sacrifice. It's really powerful, but God is using him in, in a remarkable way, in a powerful way. And I want to encourage you to uh, go to the website. You can view the trailer there. Uh, there's a way to actually purchase or download the film and watch it. It's a documentary, and it's really powerful, um, especially for those of you who are uh, veterans or are currently serving uh, in the military. Um, I also want to encourage you to, I mean, this is a, a great opportunity for us in remembrance to continue to pray for our military, for those men and women that are even now today serving in Iraq, still Afghanistan chiefly, and really all over the world uh, and serving our country. Would you uh, join with me? I want to just take a, a few moments and pray and thank God for all the American heroes who gave their lives in service to our country. Loving, loving Heavenly Father, we're, I think, maybe a little bit humbled, and rightfully so, on this Memorial Day weekend. Lord, it is a memorial. It is a, an opportunity for us to celebrate the memory of those who died serving our country. But perhaps more importantly, Lord, it's incumbent upon us to connect the dots and also in remembrance of you who went up to that hill, that Mount Moriah, that Calvary, and gave your life for our freedom from sin for all eternity. Lord, how is it possible that we can thank you enough for them and thank you enough for what you did for us? 
Lord, I pray that we'll be mindful of this, even as you are mindful of us. For we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, this is the portion of our service that we devote to Bible prophecy. We believe that we're living in the last days, not only really the last days, but the last moments of world history, and that the next event on God's prophetic clock is the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ, which can happen at any time. Uh, For today's update, I want to draw your attention to and have you turn to the Gospel of Matthew and the 24th chapter uh, will be in verses 36 through uh, 44. Uh, Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. This is commonly known as and referred to as the uh, Olivet Discourse. Jesus is on the Mount of Olives, and he is now, uh, for the sake of context, to give you the backstory, answering a question that the disciples ask him pertaining to what the signs will be uh, at the end of the age prior to his return. And then Jesus answers the question. He says there's going to be famines and pestilence. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars. There's going to be earthquakes in diverse places. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And he describes them and likens them really to birth pangs coming in shorter frequency and greater intensity. Then as you get later on into the discourse, beginning in verse 36, he goes on to say, Jesus speaking, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, up to the day Noah entered the ark. And, verse 39, they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding with a handmill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore, verse 42, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would not have let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready, because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Before we get into this, I need to uh, humbly confess to you that this particular prophecy is one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, for me to talk on because of the delicacy and the, the difficulty and the sensitivity of the subject. And of course, I'm speaking of this prophecy concerning gay or same-sex marriage, as it's now called, and I believe as it was called in the days of Noah. I think that this particular prophecy has now risen to the level of warranting our full attention by virtue of the prophecy we just read, having come from Jesus himself, and in concert with that, what has taken place just within the last couple of weeks. I would suggest to you that the recent declaration by our U.S. president concerning same-sex marriage, that it has sort of with a stroke of the pen brought this particular prophecy uh, to the forefront. I'll take it a step further and submit to you that not only is this prophecy now front page, if you will, It's also an indicator of how close we are to that day and that hour which we do not know and cannot know. So much so that Jesus warned us by way of this association with Noah and that it would be like it was in his day right up to the day, the hour, 
that they entered the ark. This is, to me, one of the most descriptive uh, details that we have in Bible prophecy of what the world is going to look like prior to the rapture. This is one of those passages that uh, I understand it as and see it as it'll be a climate, an environment, a world that is going about business as usual. And it will come as a thief in the night. People will be working, people will be planning weddings, people will be getting married. But the one qualifier is that the world will also be like what it was in the days of Noah. Well, what were the days of Noah like? Well, one of the components of the days of Noah was same-sex marriage. I happened upon an interesting website called Gay Christian Movement Watch, which, from what I can gather, is directed more towards those who consider themselves gay and fancy themselves Christian, uh, of which they are neither. But there is a movement of quote-unquote gays who consider themselves to be uh, Christians. Well, this particular website, I think, is directed more towards those. Uh, but again, uh, that's a, a contradiction in terms. I like one of Pastor Chuck Smith's quotes, uh, though in a different context. Uh, he says, they are like grape nuts. They are neither grapes, nor are they nuts. So... Pastor, are you saying that uh, gays weren't born that way? Uh, yes, I am saying that. Now, hear me out. Uh, to be gay, quote unquote, to be a practicing, professing homosexual or lesbian is a moral choice. So they're not born that way? No, but I do believe they are born with a proclivity, a propensity to be that way. They have done so many studies on the human brain, and I won't get into all the nuts and bolts of it, but it is really fascinating for those of you who are interested to do some research. But they've actually uh, seen how that the brain can completely change with one and in one who practices this lifestyle for an elongated period of time. This is why it is that lesbians will begin to take on masculine characteristics and uh, gays, uh, men, homosexual men, will begin to take on feminine, uh, feminine uh, characteristics. The brain sends that message to the body when one engages in this type of lifestyle. So let me be clear and go on record and say that to be gay is not to be born that way. It is a moral choice. And let me also go on record, lest there be any concern or confusion with regards to what the Bible says, homosexuality is a sin. It is a sin. Well, be that as it may, this website, which as far as I can tell is spot on, quotes one Janet Folger, the president of Faith to Action, in her article titled, How Same-Sex Marriage Points to the End of the World. Folger recounts how what we are seeing happen now before our very eyes is the beginning fulfillment of what Jesus said would happen before his return. Moreover, that the people had sunken into such a perpetually degenerative moral condition that these things were celebrated and viewed as normal. Boy, what a... You know, in the last days, prior to the return of Jesus Christ, it is said that they will call evil good and good evil. So, when you dare speak up against and stand for that which is right, and speak up against that which is wrong morally, uh, you are seen as intolerant, and you are seen as abnormal. And so there's this assumption that this view is normal. And if you don't hold that view, then you're not normal. Well, a different article on the same website documents what I see as capturing the very essence of what Jesus was describing concerning the days of Noah. They write that, quote, his intent, speaking of Jesus, was to inform his audience that as at his return, the conditions of the world would mirror Noah's days. Now listen, 
The article goes on to quote the Midrash Rabbah Genesis, which is a specific form of rabbinic literature of ancient Judaism commentaries of the Hebrew scriptures. It's based on the interpretation of the Torah and speaks about the subject of same-sex marriage in the days of Noah. The rabbis wrote in the Midrash Rabbah Genesis that the flood in Noah's day was primarily triggered when males started writing marriage deeds with other males. And what's interesting about this is that based on the account, same-sex marriages not only took place during the days of Noah, they were actually legal during the days of Noah. In other words, it was considered the norm. Same-sex marriage was legalized in the days of Noah. Now, some of you are already having triggered in your mind the days of Lot, Sodom and Gomorrah, because we've made synonymous Sodom and Gomorrah with sexual depravity and sexual immorality. But if you read Ezekiel, what you'll find is that that was not really the primary reason for the judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah. The primary reason for Sodom and Gomorrah's judgment was that they had become rich, they had no regard for the poor, and they had all this free time on their hands in their prosperity. And because of that, and because of their turning their backs from God, not having any interest in the things of God, God then removed his covering from them, and thus the judgment came down upon them. You remember for those of you who were with us when we were studying Romans chapter 1, and uh, the whole chapter, it would appear, is about, you know, homosexuality being a sin. But chiefly, I think it's more about God giving man over to his depravity. It's God just saying, okay, you reject me, I reject you. <clears throat> you forsake me, I forsake you. And he removes his covering, and this becomes the consequence of that. Man is given over to his evil and wicked depravity. Well, let's fast forward to our day. And I would suggest that it begs the question of whether or not we're witnessing the same exact thing happening now. Jesus describing, mirroring Noah's day to our day, and if in Noah's day, same-sex marriage was legal, and now we're seeing this move towards it, just even the number of states, I forget the exact number, that have already legalized civil unions, and of course it goes to same-sex marriages. I mean, it really shouldn't surprise us, should it? I mean, isn't this exactly what Jesus said would happen? I mean, I don't think we need to be rocket scientists to figure this out, but I mean, it just stands to reason that what's happening in our day is a fulfillment of this prophecy concerning Noah's day. Furthermore, if what we see transpiring is what Jesus was prophesying, then we need to look no further as to how close we are to the rapture. When the president said what he said, it just, in my mind's eye, and maybe it's because I'm too close to the <laughs> prophecy tree, and, but I just, I just saw the handwriting on the wall. It's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Perhaps you'll indulge me for just a moment. I want to round a corner, and maybe you can already sense a heaviness in my heart, and my heart is heavy, because I want to talk about another aspect of this that is... Well, it's overlooked, it's understated, but more importantly, it's, it's really troublesome to me, especially. And I may be speaking for some of you as well. Can you imagine how much this must grieve the heart of a loving God who created us? His original design was to create us male and female. Can you imagine how this must break the heart of a loving and merciful God? Well, why do I bring this up? Why do I point this out? Because I think that we've got the impression that God is angry. God's not angry. God's not shaking his fist. 
This is breaking his heart. This grieves the heart of God. Let me go to the other side of the table. Not only is God not shaking his fist at the homosexual, it's the homosexual that is shaking his fist at God. I think we've got it backwards. Which, by the way, evil, E-V-I-L, is live, L-I-V-E, backwards. See, that's what Satan does. He perverts, he twists, he distorts. I think Franklin Graham said it best, quote, in changing his position from that of Senator and candidate Obama, President Obama has, in my view, shaken his fist at the same God who created and defined marriage. It grieves me that our president would now affirm same-sex marriage, though I believe it grieves God even more. Would to God that we would be as David, a man after God's own heart, and that our hearts would break with that which breaks the heart of God. I want to kind of just get down to the nitty gritty here, if I can say it that way. I want to be really honest, and I, and I would just ask of the same from you. I want you to think about this. Wouldn't it stand a reason that all of us here in this church today would have to admit that we have never won even one to Christ by picketing and protesting, even boycotting. I see no example of this in the scriptures. I don't see any template. I don't see any model. I don't see the disciples or the early church protesting or picketing. I see them praying. I don't see them boycotting. I see their hearts breaking. Now, don't misunderstand me. That's not to say that we don't take a stand for righteousness, but it is to say that we may be going about doing the right thing in the wrong way, with the wrong heart, and it doesn't reflect God's heart. You know, I can't get over Romans 2.4. The Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, says, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you toward repentance? In other words, it's not the anger of God, the wrath of God, the justice of God, it's the love of God. It's the kindness of God, it's the loving kindness and the grace and the mercy of a loving God. God in his grace has given me the privilege and the honor on one occasion of leading a lesbian to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And I can assure you, it did not come by way of me picketing and protesting. Now, I've done that. I've been one of those holding up the sign now. I don't start picturing me with a, one of those signs that you see on the news. And isn't it true that the news will always get a close-up shot of some kook, probably not even a believer, that's got some sign that says God hates homosexuals? That is not true. That's not the God of the Bible. That is absolutely false, and it's a lie, and it comes from the father of lies, because if you really think about it, that's what Satan wants to try to accomplish. He wants to try to get people to think that God is mad at them, that God is angry with them. No, he's angry at the sin. He hates the sin, but he certainly does not hate the sinner. There are a plethora of websites and ministries that are devoted to those who have found freedom in Jesus Christ and have broken the bonds of homosexuality and that lesbian lifestyle and now today are walking with Jesus Christ. You know what it reminds me of is when the Apostle Paul, writing to the church in Corinth, and he's describing what that church, my goodness, if, if we only knew 
who was in and attending the church of Corinth. I get the impression that the church was filled with former homosexuals and lesbians because Paul says, and he lists these sins, and he says, as some of you were. Could you imagine that? Boy, that'll get people's attention in a church. He starts <laughs> pointing out, you know who you are. <laughs> Prostitutes and lesbians and homosexuals and murderers and adulterers and et al. You fill in the blanks. Well, why do I share that? I, I share it because I, and I, maybe it's, uh, I'm conflicted in my own heart with regards to this. I think that Christians, for the most part, and the church in general, has done more damage for the cause of Christ in the homosexual community and those who practice this lifestyle. Would to God that we would just love these people Love them. There's a story that's told. It took place many years ago. And I don't know if it's a true story or not. I, you know, but here's how it goes. I think it perfectly illustrates it. It goes like this. A man goes into a bar. Now, this is not a joke. <laughs> he actually goes running into a bar. And he wants to borrow some money to purchase a baseball bat. When asked why, he told them he had just left a meeting at the church and wanted to purchase a bat and beat the speaker up. <laughs> his friends calmed him down with a libation or two and he forgot about his quest. But a few weeks later, he returned to the same bar and wanted to borrow money to give to a different man who was speaking at the same church. And his friends asked, well, why the change? To which he responded, well, the last time I wanted a bat was because the speaker at the church told me I was going to hell and he looked like he was glad that I was. This week, the man speaking told me that I was going to hell and then he cried. I tell you. Sometimes I just wonder, you know. How many of these people who are caught up in this sin will spend eternity in hell? Well, let me close this way, simply and humbly, and I, and I want to ask two questions. I ask them of myself, uh, and I would just ask that these are questions that are answered before the Lord in the quietness of your own heart. The Lord sees your heart. Here's the first question. Does knowing that we're living in the days of Noah fill our heart with a joyfulness or a fearfulness anticipating the closeness of the rapture? See, this move now towards same-sex marriage means only one thing that the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ is out the door. Now, does that notion fill your heart with fear or does it fill your heart with joy? See, that's really the test by which you can decide whether or not you're ready for the Lord's return. See, if your heart is filled with fear, that's a good indication that you're not right with the Lord, thus you're not ready for the Lord. I want to encourage you here today. Would you, before you leave this church today, do something about that? You really need to. If your heart is filled with joy and excitement and anticipation, that's a pretty good indication that you're not only right with the Lord, but you're ready for the Lord so that his return will not be for you as a thief in the night. Here's a second question, and perhaps more importantly. Does seeing the wickedness in our day, like in Noah's day, fill our heart with hate or with love? You know, I was thinking about this this last week in anticipation and preparation for this teaching today. 
You know, when we're told that it's by our love one for another that they'll know we're his disciples? You know, that's, that's, that's the gauge by which our being his disciples is measured. They're, they're going to know that you're walking with Jesus Christ, that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ based on your love one for another. I don't think that that is exclusive. And what I mean by that is, is that this love one for another is not just brothers and sisters in Christ. No, it is that. But it's not only that. I mean, it's easy, isn't it, to love one another, except for when they take your parking spot or your pew spot. (laughs) And it's hard to love your brother or your neighbor as yourself. But for the most part, generally speaking, it's easy to love one another here. In this sanctuary, it's, it represents safety and security. We're amongst family, of course. I wonder, and again, I don't, this isn't a scorning or a beating up of the sheep or anything. I, and again, I introspectively ask this of myself. I wonder if someone walked through those doors today And they were clearly, visibly caught up in this sinful lifestyle. What would our response be? Would we look upon them with a hatred? What are you doing here? What if a lesbian couple came and sat down in the pew next to you? Or a homosexual couple came and sat down next to you? What would be your response? I think it's telling, isn't it? I wonder sometimes if God won't allow these people entrance into our lives where our paths cross if for no other reason other than we can love on them, pray for them with the hopes that we can win them to Jesus Christ. Not only is this a prophecy I think it's a prophetic word for us here today. Would you pray with me? Loving Heavenly Father, I would simply ask, and I think I pray this on behalf of everyone here today, that our hearts would be broken with the things that break your heart that we would have a heart like yours, a heart after yours. Lord, change our hearts. Change us from the inside out. Lord, I pray that what would mark us would be love, love. And Lord, for anyone here today, perhaps having been or maybe even still now struggling with homosexuality or being a lesbian. I pray that today you would meet them and touch them and minister to them in such a powerful way that it's unmistakably you. Lord, thank you. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.